Uh, today is going to be a little bit different. So good morning, VCF. So glad you're here with us this morning. Uh, we have Jeremy Bolton and his wife and his kids, uh, but just Jeremy's going to come up. <laughs> come on, you can come on up. How many of you know Jeremy? Can I see a show? Of okay, yeah. Legendary. <laughs> uh, Jeremy's going to be sharing with us this morning a little bit about the work that he does and what God has called he and his wife to do, and uh, if you could give him all of your attention. Hallelujah. Good morning, church. It is so good to be back at Valley Christian Fellowship. This is like home. This is the most wonderful place, one of the most wonderful places in the world that I've seen. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for who you are. I want to thank you for who you've called us to be. I want to thank you that we're your children, called to represent you well, here and in the nations. And I ask that you be glorified this morning. Let all the glory be unto you and your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow, I am so excited to be here this morning. This is our, our Antioch. This is our, our, our sending church. And uh, if you remember about nine years ago, um, actually 11 years ago, we were the interim youth leaders between Ben Sprague and Mike Gleim. So how many of you were part of that youth group? Woohoo! There's Heather and Morgan and Ty. There's others that um, it's so good to see. They're all grown up having children and things. I'm like, wow, that's crazy. Um, so I'm older than I, than I thought. But um, <laughs> we, we went and we pioneered a YWAM mission base in New Zealand with the Scalises that were also youth leaders from this church. So this church does a great job of sending youth leaders into being missionaries with the, with the Sprague's, the Fishers, and more. And we started this YWAM base in New Zealand with $34. And the Lord just grew it and multiplied it. Within two years, we had 60 full-time staff, and we were sending young people to the nations. We started focusing on sending um, young people to Papua New Guinea primarily as our main focus, but we were also sending people all around the world. And so we've been working in and out of Papua New Guinea um, for the past nine years. Um, this is our family. We've got Lindsay. Um, I think that one's obvious. Um, <laughs> Hunter on the left. Brave is the one maybe you haven't met. He's three years old now. In the middle, I'm holding him. And Titus on the right side. So Hunter, Titus, and Brave. They're nine, six, and three, and such a joy to raise a family. I want to talk a little bit about faith um, as we get started, because the Word of God says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. In Hebrews 8, or 11, 8, says, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And I, most, most people, when they graduate high school, they go to university. And that was my plan, but instead, for some reason, three weeks after I graduated, I got on an airplane. And I ended up in New Zealand taking a discipleship training school. And in this discipleship training school, they do... Three, three months of lectures and training on how to do missions, and then you do two to three months on the field. And the goal is to have a short-term team that has, leaves a long-term impact, that's supporting a long-term mission or encouraging a long-term mission. And so I'm 18, I get on my plane, I go to New Zealand, and I'm looking at the schedule, I'm like, great, week five is called faith. I'm like, oh, I'm going to learn about faith, this is going to be awesome. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, um, what is, who's the teacher? And I look, and there's no guest speaker coming for Faith Week. So I, I went up to the school leader. And I said, hey, excuse me, but there is, there's no guest speaker here for uh, Faith Week. Who, who's the guest speaker? And he says, oh, don't worry about it. Um, you'll find out when we get there. And I said, okay, great. So week five comes along. And they said, okay, for this week, we're going to send you guys out to New Zealand, and um, you're not allowed to bring any money or phones with you. You just trust God for a week, and he'll take care of you. And I was like, ha, ha, 
That was a great joke. And then they started pairing us up into groups of three. And then they would pray over the group of three. And they said, here's 30 New Zealand dollars, which was 20 US dollars. And they said, that's going to be your only source of income, your only money that you have for the whole week. And parents are in here like, I'm not sending my kid to YWAM. And uh, 18 years old, literally. We just pray over Jeremy and uh, this other 17-year-old girl and another 19-year-old guy. Go trust the Lord. Come back in a week. And I was like, you guys are crazy. I I didn't learn that at youth group. And um, (laughs) so we went, and, and I packed this big, heavy backpacker's pack. And, I, and it's cold. It was, I did the snowboarding DTS in New Zealand. So June in New Zealand is very cold. It snows. And I've got my, my jacket and my bag. And the 17-year-old girl goes, hey, um, Jeremy, I feel like God is saying that we need to just leave our bags behind and really trust him. I said, oh, yeah. I, said, I was just thinking, yeah, but that, that's, there's foolishness and there's wisdom. So we already seem to be on that line by going on this thing. <laughs> and she goes, no, I, I, Jeremy, I really feel like when we trust God, it's the assurance. It's the substance that he's our provider. And this young girl challenged me, 17 years old. And so I said, well, I know how to get out of this. If God tells me, <laughs> and I hear a big yes, then I'll leave my bag. God's not going to say nothing. So I grab the others and I say, Lord, if you want us to leave our backs, I pray for a big yes. And right at that moment, somebody's rugby team won. <laughs> and this dude runs right past us. He goes, yes! <laughs> so I take off my bag and I leave it. And I'm like, okay, God, you've got this. We, are, we pray and we felt like God said three items, a Bible, passport, and a camera. So we went, and I had the $30, that was $20 worth, and we start hitchhiking. This guy picks us up, he goes, where do you want to go? I'm like, well, we're all in, let's go to the airport and fly somewhere, I brought my passport. <laughs> <laughs> so we go to the airport. And I felt the Holy Spirit put on my heart. It wasn't like an audible voice of God. I just felt that I was supposed to give that person that gave us a ride $10. That was a third of my net worth. (laughs) Our team, you know. But I felt it so strongly that I gave them $10. And we went up to Air New Zealand and said, hey, could we get a free flight to Australia? And they looked at us like, are you nuts? No. And so we sat back down. We prayed, God, what do we do? We go out to the road. We start hitchhiking again. This guy um, hits some reflectors along the way. And he goes, hop in. The young girl just literally just hops in. I was like, wait, we got to like scope this guy out. We don't know if we can trust him. And uh, the girl hops in and she's like, I think it's good. We can go. I'm like, okay. So we get in and the guy is high on probably multiple drugs. And he burns out, and we all get in, and he goes, open me glove box, mate! And I'm like, okay. So I open it up, and I found out he's a marijuana farmer, and uh, over there, that's illegal, by the way. (laughs) Things are changing in America, but this is 2005. He goes, why don't you guys come over to my house for a cup of tea? I said, I was about to say, no, 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 that's okay, we want to keep going. The young girl in the back goes, yeah, great idea! He needs Jesus. Yeah, he needs Jesus, but probably not from like us. <laughs> and so we go to this, this off-road trail around Kaikoura in the South Island of New Zealand, and he has three different gates to unlock, and we get up to his house. And he opens the boot, which is the trunk. And he grabs out a big axe, and he says, come on out. And I was like, oh, I'm not Catholic, but I feel Catholic right now. <laughs> Lord, help. And then he just sets it down by the firewood. He's like, come on in, mate. So we go inside his house. He got photos of demons on his walls. There was cut marks in his couches. And I'm like, oh, God, we're going to die. And I'm thinking of Stephen, the martyr. I'm thinking 
okay, Lord, this is for you. We go in there and we're telling him about Jesus and he starts to manifest. Very upset, very hurt, very broken person. And I had a Bible. And so we, he would say, if there's this loving God, why do all these bad things happen in the world? How many of you have had that question? Or when you're evangelizing to people, that's like the number one thing. If there's a loving God, why is there all this evil on this earth? And as an 18-year-old, we're doing our best to explain the fall of man and man's own free will and sin that's in this world. And we ended up talking to this guy for five hours and praying for him. Then it got dark. So we ended up needing to stay the night with this guy. So we all slept on the floor. And um, in the morning we woke up. And he said, I can give you a lift to town. I said, great. He goes, because you're on faith week, I'm going to help, help you guys. So we went and got a Ziploc baggie packed with weed. <laughs> and he said, you can sell this. And have the best faith week of your life. <laughs> and I just remember being tempted only for 20 seconds. No, less than that. It was like, uh, no, <laughs> that's not God speaking. That's not God's provision. There's a way that seems right to a man. <laughs> but in the end, it leads to death. And so we kept, we kept um, going. And I would, I would share this story for hours if we had it. But... Um, the Lord provided a roof over our head every single night. On the third night, or the third day, we were walking, and I said, God, we don't want to get picked up by just anyone. We want to get picked up by the right person. I didn't know that by saying that, we're going to be stuck outside on the side of the road in the rain for eight hours, <laughs> in the cold, without our bags, <laughs> no change of clothes. We're hitchhiking for eight hours, and then this English bloke comes and picks us up, and he says, what are you guys doing out here on the side of the road near Blenheim, New Zealand? I said, well, we're, we're on faith week. He uses some vulgar language that I can't repeat in church. And he says, that's awesome. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and he goes, can I join you? I was like, well, usually it's a Christian thing. He goes, I used to be a Christian. And I said, well, that's a start. <laughs> He goes, no, seriously, can I join you? I'm just traveling around. I was like, yeah, you got a car. I said, why not? And so he goes, we were, it was day four, day three, day three, and we didn't have any toothbrushes. So right before we went, the girl asked uh, the Lord, the 17-year-old said, Lord, would you provide us toothbrushes? I forgot to tell you this. The day before, or maybe it was earlier. Yeah, no, it was the day before. We were walking on the side of the road, Remember that $10 bill I gave away? I looked down at my feet, and there was a $10 bill on the ground. That was day two, so at that point, I knew the Lord was with us, that this wasn't just some crazy exercise. It was God. God was here with us, but it was assurance. We knew we had to know we had to step out to see God's provision in ways that aren't normal because we don't have it figured out. If you're pushed into a place of not knowing you're forced to rely on God, right? And so in that moment, God had his grace somehow to work with crazy YWAM and take care of us. We prayed for um, bread and bananas that morning, and we walked by a bakery that was closed. And as we walked by, the lady opened the door and says, Hey, you guys hungry? Probably looked hungry. <laughs> sure. She goes, I'm closing down the bakery for the day, and I've got all this extra food, this bread. Do you want it? Oh, thank you so much. We open it up, all this fresh bread. She goes, wait, I've got one more bag for you, and gives us a bag. We open up this bag, and it's a bunch of bananas. I'm not kidding you. <laughs> Think of an 18-year-old being like, oh, God's really here. Now, the $10, the bread, the bananas, the girl saying for toothbrushes, I'm like, I think God is... We actually can rely fully on God. It's the assurance. It's the substance. It's something that's truth, that the word of the Lord is, is true. It's real. But so many of us miss that opportunity because we have it figured out. 
Sometimes it's good not to have things figured out because we get to see the Lord provide in most amazing ways. So my process of growing to learn about faith started at 18 years old. And we, we picked up this guy. His name was Felix that joined our faith week. And he um, took us to a grocery store and he said, go get what you want. So we just got some peanut butter and jelly and some bread. And we put it on the conveyor belt. And right there, he sees some pack of four toothbrushes. He goes, oh, I need a new toothbrush. And he grabbed it. Either our breath smelt really bad or the Lord was doing something, but he grabbed a pack of four toothbrushes, put it on the conveyor belt, purchased them for us, and handed them without us asking. And I said, Lord, you are amazing. And that, those kind of moments drive us to our knees to say, God, you are God, you are Lord. It's not about me. And this process of growing and understanding of, of more of the Lord started very young by being tossed into the deep end. Felix then came and um, he came and, and joined the rest of YWAM, gave his life to the Lord, and finished DTS with all of us. Ten years later, my wife and I and Hunter, we moved to New Zealand, being sent out by Valley Christian Fellowship in 2014. We were sitting at a church. In Queenstown, New Zealand, 10 years later, he had moved to England, I had moved to California. We're sitting in this church, and Felix was giving the sermon. He was sharing his testimony on how he came to know the Lord. And I was sitting in the audience, and he saw me, it looked like he saw a ghost or an angel, or something, hopefully an angel. And he goes, Jeremy, what are you doing here? And I said, what are you doing here? I moved here. He's like, I moved here. <laughs> We're in a town that neither of us have ever been to before. Sitting there listening to him, he goes, man, shares his testimony how he comes to Jesus at YWAM. And, and so he goes, Jeremy, can you come over to my house for dinner with your wife and Andy and AJ Scalis? said, yeah, we're all in. So we go to this house. And right before that, Lindsay and I had just prayed because we were pioneering this YWAM base. We have a little baby, a six-month-old at that time. We prayed for um, either funding for daycare. We left to go to the mission field $1,000 a month. That's almost impossible to live on in New Zealand, but by God's grace, he provided so we were praying, God, we need help with our son. We don't have grandma and grandpa on the field. We don't have anybody. And so we prayed for funding for a daycare or somehow access. And we're at this Felix's house eating dinner with him and this, this random lady decides to join us. And I was like, who's this random lady? Goes, oh, that's my landlord. I said, oh, great. Okay, cool. She could join us. And we share that whole story of how Felix came to the Lord and Felix goes into his bedroom in Queenstown, and he pulls out a photo, and it has myself, Anna, which is the little younger girl, Brendan, and, and him on this. He's been praying for us 10 years, and I said, Felix, your prayers work, because here I am. <laughs> Share all this story and found out his landlord was the founder of the Christian Early Learning Center. She had heard that whole story literally two days before we had prayed and asking God for help with our son. She goes, hey, I want you to know, I started this daycare, and one of the things we've always done is we've given free schooling to people in full-time ministry. If you ever feel led to enroll Hunter, we will cover him completely. I said, God, you're amazing. You're amazing. And so as we're growing in faith, you know, we're trusting God. We had $34 to start YWAM Queenstown. We're trusting God for vehicles and building. The Lord's providing all these amazing things. And we're growing in this faith, realizing, yes, we can read and understand it in the Word, but sometimes we're called to step knowing that He's the provider and He's the one that we can go and we can do these things. And so I want to share a little bit more about the Great Commission and others and because this is what Jesus was saying before he went to be with the Father. Like, what's one of the last things Jesus wants to leave with us as humanity? He says, go. 
And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. That word nations in Greek is actually ethno-linguistic groups. All language groups of the world. That we are called to go to all language groups of the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. So I know that God is still with us. I know that he's called us to go to every tribe, every tongue. Here's other references of the Great Commission. Some say there's five Great Commissions. There's this, this scripture in Revelation 7, 9, talking about what's happening in heaven. After this, I look. This is John writing as an old man. And behold, the great multitude that no one could number from every nation. Remember, every ethno-linguistic group. From all tribes and all and peoples and languages standing before the throne. Oh, thank you. You guys are on it. <laughs> and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands and crying with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven, all tribes, all languages praising the Lord. And the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. By preaching God's word, it hastens the return of the Lord. And so one of the ways that we want to get God's word into every nation is giving them the word of God. I personally believe that everyone has the right to the word of God in their own language. Because if we didn't believe that, it would be like saying, okay, we can only have the Greek Septuagint, or we can only have the Hebrew Bible. We all have to learn Hebrew to be able to read the Word of God. How much would that prevent us from the access? And I believe that everyone has a right to know God and make Him known, that everybody has the right to know God and be able to pray, worship, and read and hear the Word of God in their own language and not be forced to learn another language first. And so there's roughly 7,300 and 96 living languages in the world. Only 730 of them have a full Bible. Isn't that wild? 1,500-ish are completely Bibleists, have not even John 3.16 in their language. There's still 1,500 languages out there with no, no start to Bible. And about 2,366 have a New Testament. Those numbers change because we keep finding more languages or languages die, but um, our goal as YWAM is to start translation in a thousand languages by the end of 2033. So Wycliffe, SIL, other organizations were saying it's going to take about 150 years before everybody has the Bible. Lauren Cunningham, he's the founder of Youth with a Mission, says, okay, let's do it in one year. And everybody's like, that, that, exact, like, are you crazy? <laughs> you know, like, that's, that's impossible. He's like, no, it's not. You do the possible, God does the impossible. Okay, so he said, this is in 2019. He's like, finish Bible translation by Christmas 2020. Did that happen? No. But what did happen is the whole body of Christ got unified together around COVID times. We started all meeting on Zoom together, working together and unifying we came up with a common goal. And all organizations now, you know, Wycliffe, SIL, Seed Company, Faith Comes by Hearing, et cetera, YWAM, are saying, let's do this together. And let's have a goal. By 2033, let's have all Bible translation completed. This never happened before. It's such a time as this. These next 10 years... There's so much, so many things that are going to be happening. 
we're seeing Bible translation accelerated like it's never been before because we're all working together. Wycliffe is helping fund our, some of our Bibles and our translation work. Funding YWAM. Three years ago, they were like, YWAM's the little kid with ADD and SIL is the OCD. <laughs> and we're like, we're very different. But now we're saying, okay, YWAM has people on the ground everywhere. And yes, they might be all kind of like Jeremy, like too much coffee. <laughs> and Wycliffe has more PhDs than any other organization. Yet we're coming together. And we're using ourselves and our giftings. Like not everybody is the head, the mouth, the nose. Like we're all different, right? And we're coming together. And maybe Wycliffe can be the brains, but we need some muscle to backpack these Bibles into these places. And when, we, when Lauren first started saying, no, YWAM's going to actually do translation, they were like, no, 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 that's the Bible. Don't screw it up. <laughs> now everybody's okay with it. It's so bizarre, and we actually have, we have training in place that is happening right now that Wycliffe and SIL sign off and approve of. Isn't that amazing? We're doing this together. So uh, I, I raised my hand and said, I'll, I will go. I will go and believe God for 33 languages. Usually it's one language for 30 years. I'm like, let's just do 33 in 10 years. Why not? Sometimes, if, it, if I got done two languages, that's still more than one. So I found out, Lauren Cunningham asked me one day in 2019, when he told me to do all the Bibles in the world, he said, Jeremy, where is the most Bibleist nation in the world? Most languages left. I said, it's Papua New Guinea. He said, how many languages? I said, there's 292 languages without a Bible. He goes, okay, go finish 292 by Christmas of 2020. And I was like, ha, ah. okay. He goes, where are the Bibleist languages in Papua New Guinea? I have, I have no idea. I'm not a Bible translator. I'm a, a YWAMer. I back, backpack with my wife and kids, and we go across rivers and live in, and, and stay in villages and huts. I am not a Bible translator. He goes, good, you don't do the Bible translation. The local people do it because they're the ones that know the language. I go, good idea. <laughs> and so many of these languages don't have a written text. They don't have an orthography. And so we do something called oral Bible translation, which is essentially taking a recorder and saying, hey, could you say this Bible verse, and then you repeat it in your language, and then I go to someone else that's in a different location and said, hey, can you listen to this Bible verse? Could you record it back into English? So now all I'm doing is facilitating, but if you translate it back to English exactly how I spoke to it, I know that I'm on track for starting to have a good Bible translation. Does that make sense? So we're doing this back check oral Bible translation and recording it and giving them solar power Bibles. Found out Papua New Guinea has the most Bibleist languages. I found out that Medeng is this province here, has 100 Bibleist languages. So that's the most densely Bibleist linguistic area in the world. I had my personal assistant go and circle all the languages that didn't have a Bible. This is a SIL map of all the languages in Medang province. And he, he circled all these little yellow circles saying that these languages don't have the word of God yet. So I shared this with the director of YOM ships, the medical ship. And we put together a plan to, to use the ship to reach these languages that don't have the Bible on the coast because there's no road. There's no road down here. So this is Medang. It's a town, small town, no Starbucks or McDonald's, very hot. Probably why the missionaries don't go there. <laughs> 
And there's no road coming down here. So he said, well, let's, let's see the ship. And the ship has committed to the next five years going up, up and down the coast, bringing Bible translators, uh, uh, pastors, and people that we can find back to Medang and would we'll record the Word of God into their language. And we'll start with the book of Ruth because it's a historical narrative and it's simple. And we'll move on to the Gospel of Luke where the Jesus film can be translated and others. And so we need a place. So we started a YWAM base, the director of the ship and myself, two years ago in Papua New Guinea. This ship can put, it's got a cargo bay on it. You can put six containers in it. So it's got a crane, and you can move these containers. So while we're, this is a birthing unit that a church in Michigan just donated to us. They built it as a church. Wink. Put a hundred grand into this and just shipped it off to us. It's a birthing and women's health container. So the ship can take off the birthing and health unit and put on the dental one, depending on the needs of the people. We have one that's an oral Bible recording studio. It's a full-on recording studio, and here's, here's them practicing their uh, workshops for Bible translation, and here's them actually recording. They're all so excited. So they're recording the, the Word of God into Ruth right now in our shipping container. And so we found that th this is Medang. We found this little jetty, this dock here, and it was owned by the Lutheran church. And so we said, let's rent it. And so we signed a 50-year lease on this old warehouse. And we said, let's convert this to an oral Bible translation center. So that's the jetty there going off. The, the, see that over there, the land on the right up there? That's um, an island called Cronkit Island, and they speak the Bell language. Those are the ones that we're recording the book of Ruth into right now. So right here, right now. And we said, let's go ahead and port the ship here. We'll dock it here, and we'll build this warehouse into an oral Bible translation training center so that people can come we can translate God's word, send them out, bring them in, send them out while we're doing worship and prayer in our normal YWAM DTS schools. We'll even have a cafe where there'll be the first drive through in all of Madang. We'll have um, two stories here. So we'll have office room and a, an office and different things that we can do. And so we're believing God for these things. We've been established for the last two years. I'm blown away what God is doing in the nations right now. The fact that we can do this, we can work together with other organizations, we can collaborate. We had a leader that, was, that I was helping oversee from Kona the last two years. I've been going a few times a year. And this leader got quite sick. He got a fever of 108 degrees. That's not good. They had to be medically evacuated out. He's still alive. He's completely functional. He's okay. But as we medically evac evacuated this leader out, I just had this sense in my spirit, Lord, are you calling us to go and be on the ground for a minute? And I asked Lindsay, I said, Lindsay, do you want to come on a trip with me to Papua New Guinea just to pray? And she got lit up with excitement and joy and zeal. And she said, yeah, so me and her and Brave, we went. She's been there before, but we went to Medang together, and we were on the ground we have 15 full-time staff there right now. There was no leader. So we put a temporary leadership in, in structure in February. And we just felt strongly that the Lord was saying to surrender everything that you have going on in Hawaii, where it's great, full-time ministry, kids are in school. We love it. It's wonderful. It's perfect. But my life is not my own, and it's not, it's not mine. I've, I've died to myself so I can live with Christ. And so as a family, we all prayed. 
we had our children pray, God, is this you? And all three children said, yes, this is God. My wife's almost more on board than I am some days because I'm, I'm terrified and excited. But this is a hot climate. This is a hard place. And we're saying, here we are, God, we will go. We want to get your word into these language groups because where America is heading is not always the best and having the third world rise up in faith and knowing and knowledge of God, they might be sending missionaries to us soon. <laughs> and that's the truth. How do we preserve God's word? And so I want us to pray. Um, I want you to pray for us. And I want to invite you uh, to, to scan this QR code if you guys feel led to give towards this ministry. If you feel led to say, Jeremy, I want to sign up for newsletters. I want to be praying for you. There was a book that was written about spiritual warfare, and that was from Papua New Guinea because there are so many mixed different things that are happening there that more urgently than ever before, I feel that Lindsay and I need to raise up a prayer team. And intercessory type prayer warriors, people that are saying, I commit, Jeremy, to pray for you every single day. That to me is so much more important than any finances because I know that by faith, God provides. If we go and he's, we're being obedient to what he said, then he will take care of us without us having all of our ducks in a row. So I'm going regardless of whether we have the funding or not. That's not important to me. But what is important is that the church, this Antioch church that has sent us out, would pray for us and say, Jeremy, I've got your back. I know that this might be hard for your family. I know that this could be challenging, but we will pray for you. We need to also raise our monthly support because right now I can do little side projects in Hawaii after work and, and make up that difference. But when we're in PNG, it's illegal for me to do anything like that. So I have to completely be reliant on church. And 90% and of that comes from this church, which is amazing that it's you guys that have been doing this work. Without you, none of those things would happen. Without you those people wouldn't have the Bible. And so who's in this together? Who's in this and saying, I want to do this with you, and I want to thank you for being a part of what we've been able to do the last nine years, going from nation to nation and glory to glory. It's been such a privilege. Oh, time's up, Jeremy. I want to invite uh, Casey and, and Heather to come up. If we could have any other members from the missions committee who'd like to come up too. I, want to, I just want to start in a prayer, and I'll hand it over um, to these guys, but Lord, I want to thank you for what you did on the cross. And I want to thank you that you gave your life so that we could be free. I thank you that you broke the power of sin and death and fear. Would you break any fear off of my life, God? Any fear that's all over my family, Lord? Any fear to, so that we can trust in you? So I can't do it, God, but you can. And so I thank you for this church and the covering that they've so generously have given us, Lord. I ask that you bless this church, Lord. Bless them in their walk with you to know you and make you known in Jesus' name.